Wäre Deep Convolutional cool, Networks. Um, so when you're designing a convolutional network architecture, there's a number of choices to make, such as uh, the number of layers, the number of filters in each layer, uh, uh, the size of the filter, receptor field, and, and so on and so forth. And over the time, uh, there has been a number of architectures proposed. And as we can see from this table, uh, basically, the nets have been getting deeper and deeper over time. So the main objective of this work uh, is to figure out uh, how far we can go in terms of performance if we increase the depth uh, of the image net classification coordinates. Uh, our, main <laughs> our main contribution uh, is the evaluation of uh, convolutional networks of different depth on image net. And all these networks, uh, they uh, share the same architecture design. Uh, so basically, uh, the only thing which differs between these is their depth. And uh, on the right, you can see the comparison of uh, how, deep, how much deep our model is compared to, let's say, AlexNet, which was the state of the art a couple of years ago. Also, we look at uh, how the performance changes, uh, how the performance changes when we use uh, deeper uh, features on other data sets. And finally, we made our models publicly available for the communities, so you can download them and you can use them in your research. Um, so, as far as network design is concerned, um, we explore a single family of network of networks, where the only thing which is different is their depth. And to do so, uh, we fixed uh, the key uh, design choices so, so that the only thing which is different uh, is how deep the networks are. And may, probably the main design choice is uh, that we use very small 3x3 convolutional kernels in all layers of our architecture. And we use Stride 1 again in all layers. And this is quite different from what has been used before in the literature, where uh, people would use larger convolutional kernels with larger strides in the first layers. Um, and other details are pretty much conventional in a sense that we use uh, five max pooling layers, uh, we use uh, dropouts, and in, in the end we have uh, three fully connected layers um, where the last one performs specification. So what have we gained by using these uh, stacks of uh, three by three uh, convolutional layers? Uh, first of all, we should note, that as, we can, as can be seen from the right, um, uh, from the stack, um, when we have a stack of three by three convolutional layers without pooling in between, uh, the receptor field of that stack is actually quite large. So uh, here, if we put uh, three by three convolution on top of three by three convolution, in the end, this uh, stack has a five by five receptor field. So in other words, we just took a five by five convolutional layer and replaced it with two three by three convolutional layers. But because each layer has a proxification and linearity after it, we have more linearity in our network, which makes it more discriminative. Uh, also, um, this kind of a stack it has less parameters uh, than a single layer with equivalent receptor field size. And the last but not the least, um, it kind of makes designing architectures uh, much easier because we commit to this choice of using 3x3 kernels throughout the whole architecture. Uh, so now let's have a look at how we construct uh, these architectures. So we start with a 11 layer model uh, shown here, and then uh, we just start injecting more and more 3x3 convolutional layers. So we add two layers, and we get a 13-layer architecture. We, get, we add three layers, get 16 layers. And we add three more layers, and we get 19. So these are the four architectures which we compare in our work. OK, now, now that we've gone through the design of these architectures, uh, let's have a look at how they're trained. Um, so the input to our coordinate is a fixed size 24 by 24 image. And obviously, images and image net, they come in different sizes. Uh, so um, a conventional solution to this is to rescale each image to a certain um, image size, preserving the aspect ratio, and then, make a, and then take a, a random crop, to 24 by 24 crop, from that image. Uh, and in the prior work, uh, people would typically use, let's say, 256 uh, pixel height, um, while uh, a smaller side. While in our case, we also looked at what happens if we use multi scale training, in a sense that for each image, uh, we rescale it, um, we randomly sample the size to which we want to rescale it, from the range of 256 all the way to 512. And then we scale each image individually to this um, size, and then we take a fixed size crop from there. And by doing so, we expose our network uh, to multi scale statistics during training. And later we'll see the comparison between uh, single scale and multi scale training. Um, and apart from that, we just use standard augmentation in the form of uh, horizontal flips and RGB uh, uh, offsets, uh, and we don't use any advanced uh, photometric distortions here. Uh, the network is optimized using mini batch gradient descent uh, with momentum, 
Um, notably, the conversion is quite fast, uh, so it's about 74 epochs, which we believe is uh, due to the, to the fact that we use these small convolutional kernels uh, throughout. Uh, one important component of training uh, such large architectures is how to initialize them. And in this work, what we did, we started with a lambda model, which is actually so it can be trained by a simple uh, initialization from a Gaussian distribution with sigma for all layers. And then when we train deep networks, we take uh, the top and the bottom layers from the eleven layer network, and we use these to initialize the deeper nets. And what's important is that we don't actually fix uh, these layers, so they can still change the training, but we use this eleven layer network just to initialize it. I have to say that um, after these experiments were completed, we actually found that it's also possible to use entirely random initialization for the whole network, even for very deep nets, if we pick a uh, sigma for each layer the way that it preserves the magnitude Fast. Right, so now let's look at the testing details. Um, as I've said, uh, images and images are different size, and the input to the fun that is most probably. We've got two conventional approaches to have a networks in that case. One approach is to randomly sample uh, lots of crops and then combine uh, predictions over these crops. That was used in AlexNet, for instance. And uh, the second approach, which was used in the OFIT system uh, in 2013 is that uh, we convert the network to fully convolutional, and then we can apply it to arbitrary size images, and in the end, what we do is a map, which can then sum into a single vector of class cores. And in our experiment, we try both of these things, and in fact, we also see what happens if you combine the predictions from both approaches. And also, uh, uh, we can use multiple scales at test time by evaluating the um, network on multiple sizes and combining the predictions. Um, our implementation was a heavily modified uh, Kafka toolbox, and uh, the change was that we added support for multiple GPUs uh, for both training and evaluation. Uh, we used four GPUs, and we exploited um, synchronous data parallelism in the sense that each batch, which in our case is 256 samples, is divided across four GPUs. So in parallel, these GPUs, they process uh, 64 samples each, and then the gradients computed by each of them are combined together. And because it's all synchronized, it means that in the end we get exactly the same gradient update as if we would use just a single GPU, but much faster. It's about up to 3.7 times speed up on four GPUs, and the workload time is about two to three weeks uh, for these architectures. Right, so now let's move to the results. And first of all, let's look at basically how depth affects performance on ImageNet. And as we can see, we compare here these uh, four architectures from 11 to 19, 19 layers. And the conclusion we can make is that indeed depth is important, as 16 and 19 layer networks, they are substantially better than 11 layer network. Also, we look at uh, whether using multiple scales of training time helps. Uh, these are the red bars. And indeed it helps, um, and by quite a bit. And also, if we use multiple scales also at test time, the performance improves even further. These are the green bars. So the take, uh, the take home message from here is that uh, deep architectures are better, uh, and also using multiple scales at training and test time is also very beneficial. Um, now we have a look at how uh, dense simulation compares to using multiple crops. And here we use a large number of crops, uh, about 150. So uh, both of these techniques, uh, uh, they, they yield uh, comparable results. And obviously dense simulation is more efficient because you don't have to recompute and network from scratch over and over again on multiple crops. But interestingly, when we combine the predictions from dense evaluation, multiple crop evaluation, the results get quite a bit better, so they're complementary. And we believe that the reason for that uh, is that when we evaluate the network individually on each crop, we use zero pattern of activations to make sure that the convolution side, that um, the spatial resolution remains the same after convolution. When we apply the network densely, uh, this kind of pattern it comes naturally from other parts of an image. So the effect of a receptor field in that case is larger than 24 by 24. So that's the reason why uh, these two approaches uh, complement each other. And now let's look at these results in the context of the ImageNet uh, Challenge 2014, uh, where we uh, won the localization challenge and came second in the classification challenge. Um, so uh, the best result in the classification challenge was achieved by GoogleNet. Uh, they got 6.7% uh, error, and back then we got 7.3% uh, error. And at that point, our networks were pretty much uh, in the process of training, so after, after the challenge, we improved our results to 6.8%. Um, and our result with the single network is 7%, which is quite a bit better than 79 
achieved by Google Net. So what's interesting is that if we compare these results uh, with the winner of 2013, which is Querify, uh, both Google Net and VGG Nets are quite a bit better, and we believe that the reason is that in both approaches we used uh, very deep networks. So if we have a look at these two architectures in more detail, uh, we can see that both are very deep. It's 19 layers for VGG and 22 layers for Google Net. Um, both use multiple scale uh, training, and um, in terms of filter configuration, we use this kind of a simple approach to use 3x3 three three kernels uh, throughout the whole network. While in the case of Google Net, uh, the more complex multi branch inception modules, which combine one by one, three by three, and five by five convolution, which allow them to control the computational complexity. So as a result, Google Net is several times faster. But in terms of single net performance, we are getting uh, about half percent better results with dense simulation and even more if we use dense and multi crop. Um, after the challenge, uh, even better results have been reported in the literature. Uh, of these, uh, the deep image approach. Uh, it uses uh, networks which are based on our 16-layer networks, uh, but they use more filters so they're wider and have more parameters, and also they use more aggressive data augmentation. In the second approach, um, their networks are also related to our VGG19 networks in the sense that they also used uh, very deep uh, stacks of 3x3 three three filters, uh, but they also use parameter classification uh, units. And finally, the best result I've so far uh, was by the improved inception architecture using batch normalization. And batch normalization technique is potentially beneficial for our approach as well. Um, let's briefly look at the results on other tasks and data sets. Um, so as I've said, we won the vaporization challenge, and our, in, th in that case, uh, the task is to regress the location of bound or object bounds in box in an image. And our system uh, is based on the overfit system, which won the challenge a year before that. And I would say the main difference is that we used these very deep representations. And even though we did all the tricks which were in overfit, we got uh, quite a bit better results, as can be seen, which we believe is due to the uh, much deeper representations that we used. Uh, also, we looked at um, how these representations perform on other data sets. It's well known that ImageNet. Um, classification networks are excellent feature extractors on other data sets. And what we wanted to confirm here is that better performance on ImageNet translates into better performance on other data sets. And to do so, uh, we set up a very sort of a simple pipeline where we just take a um, very deep network, we apply it densely over the image, uh, we take the activations from, from the penultimate layer, uh, we uh, sample them and use as features for linear SVM without any fine tuning or without any additional steps. And if we look at the results, uh, here we compare with the best results reported using also convolutional features, but less deep convolutional features, say from AlexNet or, or Fito and so on. And uh, we can see that our results are either on par or better than those, which means that a uh, simple pipeline with very deep features outperforms more complex pipeline with uh, still convolutional but less deep features. And since we have released our models publicly, uh, these results uh, have been further improved and, um, because people started putting these um, very deep networks into sort of a more, um, more sophisticated pipelines. But here what's remarkable is that even with a simple pipeline we get very good results. And uh, also after the release our models have been used for object detection, image segmentation, caption generation and so on. Uh, to conclude, uh, content depth is indeed very important uh, for image net specification. And uh, we constructed these models by using very, deep, uh, by using, uh, very small convolutional uh, layers with the 3 by 3 convolution kernels. And we released our best performing models, 16 layer and 19 layer models, uh, publicly. They're natively available in uh, CAF and um, Markov -like formats, but in principle they can be used in any uh, package which has a good in the backend. So you might want to download them and try them in your search. Thank you. Well, if you look at, if you look at uh, the samples where, uh, let's say, uh, the network made a mistake, sometime, sometimes you can see that actually it comes down to um, annotation issues or these are just very, very sort of a complex uh, cases. So sometimes it's just due to different scales. So um, basically at this operating point, it's very hard to sort of a, a pinpoint that there's a sort of a big flaw in the architecture. 
because at that kind of performance, uh, there's not much to sort of go for. Um, but I would say all, all these cases are kind of extreme. So I, so I can't say that there's a certain class of image net images where this network does not work on. So it mostly comes down to a case by case basis. Thanks very much. Um, and especially thank you for making the models uh, available to the public. Hopefully that will kind of level, level the playing field a little bit. Uh, so there's clearly sort of a race to get the best uh, classification error. I'm wondering, have you examined across the other works? Are we basically, as a, is, is the community basically just increasing model complexity and getting better performance? Or is there any, is there any work here where you're looking at the number of free parameters in the model and somehow penalizing the number of free parameters? Or are we just sort of on a race to add as many free parameters into the net as we can and reduce, you know, asymptotically? Reduce the error, error. Well, it's not only about the number of parameters, it's also about how we structure these parameters into network. Uh, so for instance, um, the number of parameters in our architecture uh, is about the same as it was in uh, Zylan Fogus network and in Overfit network before that. But we structure them in such a way that uh, the architecture is very deep. Uh, so we have less parameters in each layer, but we have more layers. And if you, look, if you look at the best performance of image net networks these days, whether it's ours or, let's say, Inception, uh, they both sort of are built on this idea of using very deep representations. In the case of Inception, they also found, found a way to minimize the number of parameters by arranging them into these kind of Inception modules. So I would say it's not just about the number of parameters, it's also about how we structure these parameters. And also, in, um, so some other improvements can come from the fact how you optimize these networks. Because uh, most works so far have been used in uh, just gradient descent, and maybe we can get better performance based on more advanced techniques. In our case, using 19 layers did not really give us uh, much improvement over, yeah, here. Yeah, if you look at the green bars, yes. Uh, but also, well, for sure it comes down to the actual details of the data set and the details of the architecture. Yeah, because, for instance, uh, deeper than that. And also, other works which I mentioned, which also took our ideas and sort of pushed them further in terms of depth. Um, so there are quite a few factors to take into consideration here. Maybe one of the reasons why we could not see further improvements by using more, more layers is that uh, at that point, uh, the way we trained these networks was to take a lemon layer network and use its w layers to initialize uh, the deep architectures. So maybe they were prone to getting captured in more or less the same uh, minima. While later we actually found that, it, and other um, groups also found that it's possible just to use random initialization appropriately uh, scaled for each layer. I can't give uh, an exact number saying that 16 is just about deep, and 19 is perfectly deep, and 22 is too deep. Uh, it's, it's all the, the actual details, but if you look at the kind of number, it's about 20 layers uh, for that kind of data set. And also it comes down to how much augmentation you put uh, into this. Obviously, the image is quite large, we are still overfitted, so it's important how much augmentation you put. In our case, the augmentation was kind of basic, and further improvements could be achieved uh, by using more sort of extreme automatic distortions and so on. So it's hard to give us an exact number. Okay, next, uh,